Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's conversation with Matin Patelis and Carolyn, Dr. Carolyn Finney, which is titled Ride or Die, Fractured Environments, Building the Community and Keeping It Real. I'm going to be one of your moderators tonight. Uh, my name is Mary Scott. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a first year here at Milderbury, and I'm interested in, in majoring in environmental chemistry. Hey, I'm the other panelist, I, or, sorry, not panelist, um, moderator. I'm Charlie, use he, him pronouns. I'm a junior environmental justice major, studio art minor. I'm zooming in from my room in Weybridge House at the bottom of the hill. Um, so before we introduce our panelists, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. And I wanna preface that by saying, um, as I read this institutional Middlebury College land acknowledgement, know that it is not perfect or complete. As Mary Scott and I have learned from an Abenaki activist in our class with Professor Finney, land acknowledgements are not permanent or singular, but rather ongoing journeys. They require us to consider our own relationship to colonization presently and historically, and to put in work towards decolonization, whose ultimate goal is full indigenous sovereignty and the returning of stolen land. That being said, I will now read Middlebury's land acknowledgement. We pause to acknowledge that Middlebury College sits on land which has served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples since time immemorial. The Western Abenaki are the traditional caretakers of these Vermont lands and waters, which they call Indakina, or homeland. We remember their connection to this region and the hardships they continue to endure. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respects to the Abenaki elders and to the indigenous inhabitants of Turtle Island past and present. We give thanks for the opportunity to share in the bounty of this place and to protect it. We are all one in the sacred web of life that connects people animals, plants, air, water, and earth. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Mary Scott. Right, so before we get into the introductions, we just wanna let everyone know that around eight o'clock-ish, uh, we'll be opening up the conversation for a Q&A. So we just wanna turn your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to put any questions you have in there um, and there's also an upvote function. If someone else asks a question you're, you're interested in, we'll, we'll look at it, we'll see it, and we'll get you some answers. Um, just wanna emphasize that this is a safe space and we encourage you to be inquisitive, keep an open mind, and don't worry about making mistakes. Um, before we get started, we wanna ask you to consider the following question as you listen to Dr. Finney and Mating. Um, what environmental communities are you a part of locally and globally? How do you represent them and how are people like you represented within them? So now I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing Dr. Carolyn Finney, who is a scholar and artist in resident here at Millbury. Uh, Dr. Finney is a storyteller, author, and cultural geographer. She is deeply interested in issues related to identity, difference, creative, creativity, and resilience. She pursued an acting career for 11 years, but her experience, experience backpacking through Africa and Asia and living in Nepal for five years changed the trajectory of her career and motivated her to return to school to eventually earn a BA, an MA, and a PhD. She has been a Fulbright scholar, a Cannon National Parks Science Scholar, and received a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship in Environmental Science. Her recent work focuses on the experience of marginalized communities in outdoor spaces, with one of her most acclaimed pieces of work being her book, Black Spaces, White Spaces, published in 2014. A saying I hear Dr. Finney say quite often is, whose story counts? And I'd love for you all to keep this in the back of your minds as you listen and participate in today's conversation. And now I'll pass it off to Charlie to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Mary Scott. 
Now I have the pleasure of introducing Martin Kutelis. He is an adventurer, entrepreneur, and photographer who seeks to elevate the importance of community, food, and wildness. Martin started off as a mountain guide and educator. He spent more time outdoors than in and developed a broad skill set for communicating with groups of people and managing the complexity of adventure travel. Drawing on his artistic side, he evolved into an adventure photographer, capturing moments of human movement in wild places. As an adult, he uncovered the hunter within and identified a need in the market for hunting apparel that speaks to the hunt to eat ethos of many hunters. He co-founded Hunt to Eat, a lifestyle apparel and education brand, which seeks to build and educate a diverse communi community committed to conserving wild places and animals. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it over to the panelists to begin the conversation. Thanks, Charlie and Mary Scott. Excellent. Mating, mating. <laughs> Here we are. It's us. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> oh my God. I got okay. you. This was a this is a strange big day. day. Yeah, it's a big night, a strange day strange week, a strange month, a strange year. Um, and I ain't saying anything. Um, uh, oh, I, I'm having a hard, <laughs> I rarely have a hard time putting two words together. And I have to say that, you know, and to tell the audience, like many of you may be, you know, right before I, I got on here this evening, I was watching the verdict and watching everybody respond to it and had my own emotional uh, moment with it as well as um, trying to get myself together because I'm going to be now talking to you know someone in public and we have to be and I was just like you know this is actually why you and I are coming together as far as I'm concerned you know, like in the broadest sense like we're coming from I mean this is my opinion so uh, you know that we're coming from where we stand and this idea of common ground, which, you know, you know, together, Mating and I want to say to the audience, we actually came up with a title. I mean, we, we, we sp spent a couple of Zooms, like, talking and thinking about what do we want to talk about? How can we kind of show up in the room? Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that. I think a lot about that all the time for a lot of different reasons, but I've been thinking a lot about it today. Um, so... I'm going to put the first question on the table that Mating and I came up with in part because we want to, how do we bring ourselves wholly in the room? And then we're going to take off from there and see um, where it is that we go. But um, if those of you who came to the talk tonight read the quote that was underneath, um, the, there was the announcement that we're going to be here and the quote where it's actually a quote from Mating where he asked the question that I'm going to give up being misunderstood. And actually, when he said it, like the first time he said it, I went, ah, I had to write that down immediately because <laughs> it resonated so much for me. Um, and actually, my thing, what I want to say to you that I didn't say then was that at what part of what happened was that you, it's the way that you gave agency to the fact that you can make a choice about giving up being misunderstood. That's what actually messed with my head and actually blew my mind at the same time because I, I, real, I understand that there's sort of a pillar of my own existence for better or for worse. You know, I never framed it entirely as being misunderstood, but it's being misrepresented, being unseen, being devalued, which for me is all part of that being misunderstood. But I realized I had never articulated to myself that I can decide that I'm not going to be that anymore, even though so many of my own personal actions and the way that I've chosen, been able to choose what I do in my life and how I show up is in part that, but I didn't ever say it like that. And it kind of, uh, it's been affecting me. That's what I want to tell you. Um, it's been affecting me. And some of that has been hard, you know, because it means having to own my own fragility on the mm. inside. And yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I want to put it in your court and they're not, it can come back to mine, but let me, you said the thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. To, uh, 
there's agency and choice. I think that's really, that's powerful. Um, yeah, and, and uh, when we give up being misunderstood, we've got to deal with who we are and, and how we show up. Um, and so the, the quote is that who I am is the possibility, key distinction there, the possibility of the transformation of humanity. Yeah. And why I hope today is just a shimmering hope of that possibility that, that something can, can transform. Um, One of the quotes, just to interrupt you, just because I have to say it, you're, what you just said, and I wrote it down because I was writing so many things down when I was listening to different people speak, you know, on television and one of the CNN newscasters, I was Don Lemon, I love me some Don Lemon, but Don Lemon said, I don't know where I wrote it in my head, somebody said to him, there's a sea of change, you know, do you see, you know, politicians and famous people four years ago barely, either barely understood what Black Lives Matter meant, barely did any, if they did understand it, they didn't want to talk about it or they kind of wanted to whitewash it literally <laughs> in a very particular way and now they're all saying it they're all like black lives matter black lives matter like both because they have a grip on it and so it was jake tapper who was asking don lemon so do you think there's been to see a change and what don lemon said he says well i think there's a sea of change in terms of you know a people's level of awareness but there hasn't been a sea of change in terms of practice and I was like, drop the mic, walk out of the room. <laughs> That's how I felt. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I was trying to think of the right thing to, to talk about or say in this momentous day. Um, but uh, I guess something stood out to me that I saw uh, uh, our common friend, Rue Map post the other day. And that is... Uh, Essentially, the gist of it is that if I'm driving to the trail to go hunting, I don't think about signaling. I don't think about how fast I'm speeding. I don't think about the fact that I have a gun in the car. I don't think about those things when I get out of the car. I don't think about paying the, the ticket or whatever at the parking lot. Um, in my daily existence, I don't think about somebody killing me. And I just want to say that I see and under you know try to understand my privilege in this world and uh and to those who have to those to rue and to the other folks who have asked um you know we we will continue to see the privilege and and put power um you know reflect power to where where uh, where it isn't um and resources and uh yeah, that's the best that I can do right now is to is to do that because I have the privilege. Um, but tell me more. I mean, tell because I want to say more. <laughs> I always want to say more about being misunderstood. I mean, thinking uh, about right. yeah, just because yeah. I, I mean, I believe we all have privilege. We all just don't have the same privilege in the same way, and you know, in this question, the conversation about race and race in America, yeah, you know, for me, I'm not going to argue with the idea that whiteness is centered in a very particular way, you know, and I always say that whiteness is also incredibly diverse. And I know that some of the stuff you've told me about your own life is like, yeah, you know, we don't always see that either and right. how that can shape a person's experience. Right. Um... My dad literally texting me to sit closer to the camera, so I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, so to to go to back out of, I guess the you know today's today's and kind of the, our lived experience recently and today and all of that. Um, yeah, being misunderstood is uh, uh, harkens back to the to the day my lovely parents who are on this call um named me right and they named me one of the one of the second most common name in latvia uh Martinsch. um and it's a really hard name for most americans uh most english speakers um 
and uh, somewhere in first grade or so, they decided that they were going to call me something different um, because they couldn't figure it out. And I, I'm honestly not even going to share that name that I was for 23 years because um, it's just not who I am and I don't like, I don't even want to put it into people's heads. But I lived by an entirely different name that was just put upon me. Um, and it wasn't until I got to college and I had, um, had the ability to essentially choose a name um, as an outdoor educator. Um, and we, this is, we joked about this as we first met one of the first times when we uh, hung out, um, was that we had these nicknames. And so I actually, my nickname was Thunder. Um, and I can, I can place people by a couple of years um, if they ever call me Thunder. Um, and there's a bit of like Latvian mythology that goes into that name and whatnot, but I used it as a trail name and as an educator. Um, and then when I kind of went out of that world and went into the professional world, I decided to phoneticize my Latvian name and uh, make it the, uh, the phonetic pronunciation of the correct um, conjugation. So you can conjugate Latvian names seven different ways. And so I chose Mothing and spelled the way you see it today. Um, and still, it, uh, it throws uh, native English speakers. Um, so it's tough to not be seen as who you are, like in the, just in the pronunciation of your own name every day. Um, yeah, I, it's, uh, that, I think that's, that started the whole being misunderstood. Um, I don't know, where do you want to go from that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I can say, uh, I'm thinking about being misunderstood and I have it, you know, for me, I come at that not so much from the misnaming, but I can say that when I first went to elementary school, right up into high school, that because my last name is Irish, <laughs> Finney, <laughs> that before some people, and let me be very particular about this, before some white people would see me, you know, if a, a young white friend of mine in school invited me over to the house to play and I have actually had white parents look at me and go, oh, <laughs> you know, I thought you were going to have red hair and freckles or, oh, you know, you know, oh, <laughs> not saying anything at all, but I could see that the look in their face, this wasn't what they expected, right? Um, for better or for worse. Uh, and that's confusing to say the very least in terms of what does it mean to be me and what does it mean to be Carolyn Finney and actually that name is Irish so what does that actually have to do with me and then let's complicate that even more because I'm adopted so it's not even actually my original name which I can't actually get at because the law says I can't get at that right even though it should be by my by you know, it should be my right as far as I'm concerned. So we start to get complicated and then you throw the race element in there. And I can't tell you how many times people who have no idea of who I am would stop me on the street and ask me if I was mixed. Where are you from? How, and I always think about like, how do people get comfortable? Like they don't even know you to ask you those kinds of questions, but I was brought up to be kind of a polite kid. So the, and the fact of the matter is I would always try to answer the question unless they caught me on a really bad day. As I've gotten older, you know, I, I, I'm less polite about it. Uh, it. It sort of translated to people wanted to talk about my hair, you know, total strangers that I don't know. So the misunderstood thing, sometimes I think if I'm feeling really generous and big hearted and open and trying to understand other human beings, as I try to do, is like, it's as though I'm saying about they just don't understand me. The way I've been feeling for the last two weeks is not like that. And it's because I can tell that I'm tired. I talk about this stuff all the time. I, I'm tired. And even in watching the verdict tonight, which I'm really, um, I don't know what the right word is because I'm not happy that somebody's going to jail, but I am happy that justice is served in a very particular way. But, oh my God, you know, it's 400 years, y'all, really? And just right down the street, Duante Wright was killed. So what's gonna happen there? You know, it's kind of, I, I hold it in, in, in a mixed way and misunderstood lets, for me, lets some people off the hook. Because I actually think in some cases, it's not that you're misunder people are misunderstood. I think there's something else going on in there, but maybe I'm just, 
in a mood mm -hmm. right now. Um, no, well, I mean, I, <laughs> when it comes back to my own name, it's, uh, you know, I say, I say what my name is and they say, well, can I just call you Martin? No. <laughs> right. No, you may not. Yes. And if you choose to, I'm always in a mood. I'm going to tell you, I'm just not going to reply to you. I'm going to turn my back to you. How rude could you be to not see somebody? Man, yeah. my goodness. Someone's about to tell you how rude they can be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a laziness there. Um, there's a, there ha we have to do more. We have to be better. We have to listen. We have to learn. We have to be better. There isn't a, you don't get an out in this these days. Well, as I like to say these days, no one is exempt. It's one of my favorite oh. phrases, right? And it's, but for me, how we show up and what that means, I think is different for a variety of reasons. Um, let's talk about hunting. Because you and I got into an interesting conversation about hunting, right? Well, here we are. I mean, you know, when I, my experience at Middlebury, I haven't been here very long and I've been getting, so this is the end of about two years, but for the last year, I haven't been on campus because of the pandemic, but I've been teaching and engaging with the community in a variety of ways. And, you know, some of the way that I understand the larger environmental narrative, you know, about the questions of sustainability and, how we're going to be in relationship with each other. I mean, they're great and there's wait, there's focus on that. Um, and hunting makes it messy. Woo, I think it makes it so messy. And so that part of me that likes that because it makes it messy. I mean, so I wanna tell the audience that <laughs> my experience with guns, Okay, we Mutting and I were joking around about the potential titles and what we really wanted to call tonight was, what is it? Um, two hogs, a turkey and a black girl with a gun. <laughs> That's what we want. Because when we were talking, you know, and he, he can tell you the two hogs and a turkey or two turkeys and a hog, maybe it was on a hunting trip. He takes people out on hunting trips, diverse people out on hunting trips in different parts of the country. And I had said, you know, this is back in the nineties, I was, um, in a relationship with a, a German hunter for a couple of years. And um, in Germany, uh, I did some target shooting and that was my first time, you know, really doing something with a gun. And I happened to be kind of good at it. But when he tried to get me to go out hunting, I was like, oh no. And not only was I, oh no, oh no. I prayed that him and his friend wouldn't kill a single thing, which they didn't. <laughs> I was praying hard. And then I enjoyed a big plate of meat on my table. Later that evening for dinner, that was also incredibly tasty. So the contradictions were really there. Um, my dad collects guns. He's collected guns for years, and he has quite a lot of them that we've since removed from him because he has dementia. Uh, and then Mating said, you should come on the next hunting trip and maybe bring one of your father's guns. I went into some weird psychological, like, that freaked me out. Like, there were so many layers there of... Uh, it would be my father's gun and what would that mean uh, that I would maybe have to kill something live and I just don't think I could do it unless it was for my survival you know there was a line there I couldn't cross that I could be with diverse people and people who are comfortable around guns and know how to use them and think more diverse ways that my own bias against how I even understand what hunting is um, I would be able to confront it, and I want, and I, and I, and I think that that's really important. Um, and I got really scared at the idea. It just scared me because then we got down to it, and Mating and I said, "Oh my God, I hope I, I shouldn't say this, but um, if it was just all men and me as the only as I, I, I identify as a woman, so if I." Eh, show up how comfortable would I feel if it was all white people and or white men and me and I went oh, oh, oh you know like how would I feel because I'd have to the thing you said in the beginning about how you don't think about you know your, your guns in the car you don't think about you know all those things you think. I think about I think about I never had a gun in the car but I think about all that stuff all the time especially if I go to somewhere I've never been before you yeah. know 
And I've been to most states in this country in some capacity or the other. And in most states in this country, I think about that, especially when it's just me. And I walk into a space that there isn't a lot of people who look like me in the space. You know, I, I just, my mind starts to do all those gymnastics about, okay, what do I have to do to, you know, make it okay? You know, and part of that is the assumption that it won't be okay. And sometimes that assumption is wrong, but it's also embedded in a history that is said otherwise. Yeah. Very recently. Yes. Very recently. Um, and so I'm supposed to, I want to ask this question of the uh, folks who are listening in, uh, is how many of you here consider yourselves hunters? Um, and there's a quick poll there. You can answer yes or no. Um, and when, while you do that, I'll, uh, I don't know, I can talk a little bit about hunting. Um, but I, uh, it, you, like you said, the environmental movement, like when you bring the hunting aspect, it gets really, um, gets really weird. Um, and boy, does it. Um, there, the history of the environmental movement, um, particularly the history of the conservation movement, is littered with um, bigots and racists and machismo to to end all you know conversations. Um, and and uh, one of uh, I was just listening to a, a book on tape as we were driving out to uh, to the mountains this weekend, and uh, they're talking about Hornaday. And Hornaday was a uh, was a hunter, a conservationist um, from. Uh, from, the, from essentially the, the time period where we were killing animals to essentially make sure we had a, a, a relic of them and put them in the museums, um, you know, the, the time frame of Teddy Roosevelt and, and whatnot. Um, and in one foul swoop, they, the, the author says uh, that when Hornaday thought about, um, you know, ever visiting the Bronx Zoo where they were putting these uh, uh, remnants into of animals, uh, he said, well, I would never want to really go to New York because all the Jews from the slums of Riga are, are you know, taking over there. And in one foul soup, he offended both my wife, who's Jewish, and myself being someone from Latvia, where Riga is the capital of Latvia. Um, and I was like, wow, that's, I never heard that part, you know, like, I knew that he did terrible other things of literally keeping a, a colored person in a cell with a monkey to see how they would interact. I mean, that's just, you can't make this shit up. This is yeah. terrible. Um, yeah. It's terrible. And that, that is the history we have to deal with in the hunting space is that um, the, the greats, if you will, of who, who conserved and did all this stuff that we, you know, that we now think the science behind it is so fantastic and, and it's, it's littered with such hate and, and just, I don't know, just, being terrible human people um, who just didn't, you know, to say they didn't know better or whatever, like, it's just not okay. Um, and so I don't, I don't know necessarily how we deal with that, but we're dealing with the repercussions of that right now. And I would, and I, for me, well, the hunting community doesn't exist in a vacuum. Yeah. It was that way because so was pretty much the rest of the country. Yeah. I mean, in, in various forms, I'm not saying everybody was that way, but this is the part for me that is incredibly frustrating to get people to understand that racism isn't simply about what one individual does to another, that systemic racism means it is in everything. And I'm so, I've gotten so frustrated by saying, you have to understand the comment is sticking in my head, how you were saying, your friend was saying, I don't have to think about, I don't have to think about the gun in the car, I don't have to think about when I go out. Not having to think about all those things in part is because the system serves yes. you in a particular way. I'm not saying you don't work hard. I don't, I'm not saying you don't struggle. I don't, I'm not saying any of those things. I'm saying it serves. The system has not served other people for so long in the ways that it says it does. That's what I also mean about the practice, the see, see of a see if changes come maybe around awareness, maybe. Ask me in five years, ask me in five years, because I want to see these things change. So I guess what I'm saying to you, I'm not getting worked up at you, I'm just worked up by 
by, by my very nature at this very moment in time, um, is that for the, the hunting community isn't any different from that. It would be surprising to me, actually. I can't think of a single community of any kind that doesn't have some impact because of systemic racism. Right. And I right. dare anybody to come up with one. I really do. Don't try to tell me it's a religious community. Don't tell me it's an academic community. Don't tell me it's a political one. Don't tell me it's an environmental one. Don't tell me any of it. Because I would just, I, I've reached the point of, I'm still keeping my heart big, but I'm, I'm you know, that it's, it's in everything. It's in everything. Yeah. And so how, how do we start to see that? How do we put ourselves and we, the we here I'm talking about is white men. How do we put ourselves in a place where we can see and, and come to understand the lived experience of people who are not white men, who they, that, that is different, right? And that's, that's, my answer is that we build community. You yes. have to be in community with people. And we have to listen to them and we have to understand that there simply is a different lived experience. And it's all you got to do. Like it's, you know, I mean, sure, there's action afterwards, but let's just start by being in relationship with other folks that, that aren't what don't look like us um, and, uh, and start listening to what they're saying. Because there's plenty of people who are saying what their lived experience is. They're yeah. telling you what it's like. And it's unbelievable that you could sit and listen to you talk and go, nope, I don't believe your lived experience. That's unbelievable to me. And yet, here we are. Because I think one of the reasons for that is because when, you know, at my, in my experience as a human being, that when someone tells me their lived experience, something that's hard, something that's so very different, for me to hear it, you know, I feel like another person's experience in part is a reflection of my own. It doesn't mean it's the same. It means that it, I have to think about my own position. I have to think about my own self in relation to their stories. You know, I have to, especially if it's something that concerns a larger sort of set system or something at play. I met, I'm, I think we met in 2019, 2018, maybe 2018, 2017. We were both speaking in Breckenridge, Colorado. Yeah. And we were, so Breckenridge, for those of you who haven't been, it's in, it's like a, some resort place, like it's a sports ski, all yeah. these things. And there was some kind of natural resource management environmental conference, particularly for the state of Colorado. So there were nonprofits and government people from all over the state. And both Mating and I, we didn't know each other, but we were asked to be two of the main speakers. So I did my little thing, I did my thing, da, 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 and it was, you know, good response. It was a room that was predominantly white, but you had a diverse set of the perspectives people were coming on, because there were anglers, fish, fisher, what do they call them, fishers and anglers, or anglers and the, the angling community, that's all I can remember, right? I Meaning the fishers, the hunters, the anglers, there were government officials, there were nonprofit people. And then I stuck around because I was like, who's this, uh, my team, I gotta see what he's gonna be talking about. The thing that was so great and why I was like, ah, because there were so many things that resonated for me, even though you and I on the surface are so very different in terms of how we lived our life, what we look like, who we are and how we show up. But you're, you're, you're using your own story of from this sort of adventure outdoor guy and you, <laughs> the way that you kind of showed up to this point of like you're running this organization and hunting as a way not, not only to think about sustainability, but to think about community. And to think about, I understood, you know, diversity, but also it was your, and I hope you can forgive me saying this, because this is what I resonate with. It was sort of your oddness, <laughs> because I feel odd all the time. So that, that was what I meant. Like, I was like, oh, I recognize that, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's sort of the oddness of it. It was, there was something odd in the best way. It's the best word I can come up with right now that was really resonant for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think to explain that oddness, I think to the, the folks listening is, um, is to get to this, right. The, the group of people that were there. Yes. Super, it's Colorado. So it's white by its nature. 
um, diverse. Yes, they're, um, you know, they're coming from nonprofits. They're coming from environmental nonprofits. They're coming from hunting groups. They're coming from government, um, cattle ranchers, you know, yes. that whole dynamic too, farmers, ranchers. Um, so to be there for me was odd because, and this also goes back to being misunderstood, right? Is that if you ask me who I am, um, I'll tell you that I'm an athlete. I'm a trail runner. I'm a skier. Like if I could go do something tomorrow, I'd go ski the amazing snow we have. Um, first and foremost, if I have had to, somebody asked me on Instagram once, if I ever had to do, if I had to ski or hunt the rest of my life every day, what would I choose? Hands down, I'd go skiing every day. If you ski, <laughs> if you ski, if you skied powder, you know that it's the closest thing to flying, and it there's nothing beats it. And there's and and that's saying a lot because there's a I don't even get the level of awareness or expression that I do when I'm hunting. I don't get it with skiing. It's maybe that skiing is just that much more fun. Um, but I'm an athlete, and so here I am, an athlete, and then in the previous life, I'm this this hippie dirtbag kid who lived in a van and, and taught kids outside and went rock climbing all the time. Um, and then I turned into a, you know, lycra clad uh, road cyclist, um, you know, racing bikes around the country. Um, and then I just like happened into hunting. Um, I happened into saying, we need better t-shirts for the hunting crowd and like why do they still sell this garbage at these stores that nobody wants to wear and it has some terrible message on it about hunting? Um, so here I am standing in front of people and I think they're like, who is this guy? Like, is he a hunter? No, is he, he doesn't look quite like we think of hunters, you know, and it's, what is he? And it's, um, yeah, it feels awkward to occupy so many different spaces when, when so many people want to say, nope, here's, you only get to check one box. Here's yeah. your one box that you get to check. Um, it's like, no, I'm, I'm taking all these, taking all this stuff. This is all me right here. Um, yeah. And then, and then it is, you're just messing with people's heads. They don't know what to do with you. They don't know where to put you. Um, let me ask you this. Cause when you were saying that about checking one box and I was thinking, Oh, that's interesting. So I, cause I have these multiple ways that I show up in the world and also, Sometimes people try to categorize me, but you know, it was so weird when you said that the first thing I thought, oh yeah, well the box I have to check first is that I'm black. And I went, that's not what he means. He means in terms of what it is that you do. And I went, oh, right. You know, I'm having this conversation with myself when you were talking like, well, that's the box people won't say. Yeah. Hey, like, I, like yeah, let's, let's be honest about this. Yeah. I don't, I didn't say that because I don't have to think about it. For all of you listening, we don't have to think about being white. And that's not okay. So I'm sorry that you have to think about that first box. I don't want our world to be that way. Yeah. I think uh, I'm sorry too on one level. On another level, <laughs> I am... Um, I don't know, it's, it's allowed me to be here in a certain way, in a certain capacity right now. I, I, the problem for me is not so much in having to think of that box. The problem for me is that it is a box. That's the problem. And it is a box that I didn't create. Yeah. That is the problem. You can think of me as black or brown all day long. I ain't got no problems with that. Just like Carolyn's got brown eyes. You know, you can say that all day long. Actually, it's blackness, brownness, whiteness. You know, none of it for me should be a limitation. The problem is, for me in this country, historically, it's always been a limitation, at least in terms of the powers that be that construct the box and say, here's the box. And if you you're in the box. <laughs> yeah. You know, that for me is the problem. Yeah. Um, we were talking about how, how we, how we build community. Well, offline, we we're talking about it. Right. And that's, yes. um, it's interesting when I say like, I, I want to be all these things. Um, but in building community around, uh, how we protect 
the how we protect the wild places, how we protect the wild things that exist there. Um, I would like for all of us to start not checking off the boxes of uh, of, of labels, but of values, right? Of shared values, um, because I we like we talked about it's a it is a limitation to the environmentalist and, and to, to the movement of people who care about you know drinking clean water and uh, breathing clean air um, that we have to somehow be in the right group to like have to you know to fight 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 for the right thing and it's like boy can't all of us who care about clean air and clean water just say that's enough um, and 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 fight for that um well wait let me so let me say something there like i don't know if it's what you mean but i have to say uh i was thinking of I, the shared values thing always makes me uncomfortable because not from you but because i've heard it used by politicians and you know mm -hmm. the powers that be used that all the time and i'm like what do they mean exactly for me the the top of my list if i have a list of values for me the top of the list is common humanity hands down you can't don't even come to me with anything else on that damn list if you cannot meet that marker because then we don't have to agree on a lot of other things but if we can't agree on that and the problem for me is that some people don't agree on that they may not say it but that's what they're thinking and that's what they're feeling it's like i have to know that you know, your common humanity, that's what I can, that resonates. I don't have to have anything else in common with you. For us to find a way, in my opinion, to have, be on common ground and have a conversation about clean air yeah. and clean water and good food and access to beautiful places and all the things that many in the environmental movement care about. I have to know you care about me. Right. And I have to care about you. Don't tell me just that you care about all that other stuff. What does that got to do with us? It's right. got everything to do with us. I know it does, but actually you can't get there without going here first. And I want to know what that is. That's the practice that I'm really frustrated with and I'm really tired with because people think because their lives are too busy that they don't have to do this. They can just do that over there and it'll be all right. No, it, it won't be. Um, you, see, you see me getting worked up. Sorry, I'm watching. It's okay. It, it is always okay. Um, yeah, uh, the shared humanity um, just makes me think of like the sh uh, chosen family. We've talked about that a little bit. I've got to give I've got to give a little shout out to my uh, my Latvian support group that I know took a little uh, field trip here today to be with us. Um, they are chosen family, and they because they see my humanity and I see theirs, and that's where we start with. Um, and when we talk about chosen family, right, that's like the idea that. Um, lots of folks will tell you um, about their family. And it's like, oh, you've got to, no matter what, blood, blood, family's family. And it's like, yeah. um, no, if the folks in my family, if you're listening by any stretch, if you don't want to start with seeing Carolyn's humanity here, then we don't have a conversation past that. We don't, because you've got to understand that that, that, that is the step one. And then so, we can talk about all the rest of it. You said blood, blood. And so I have to jump in as the adopted person that so far yeah. doesn't know of any person in the world that I'm blood related to, except the 500 yeah. hits I get on the DNA thing that keeps telling me, you've got to, we found another DNA relative. And I don't know who these people are yet, but that's kind of interesting. Um, I, so my sense is it's, it's all chosen. The idea of chosen family has actually always been my reality. Right, in part. I mean, I was not, you know, as a baby, right, obviously, and I'm adopted into a family, and it doesn't seem like I have any choice. But I'm always looking for that everywhere, because I'm looking for something resonant, something uh, familiar, mm -hmm. you know, something that means that I will be seen rightly. Yeah. Um, and also because I'm trying to see other people rightly who are different, right? That's, you know, it's not always all about me, right? It just happens. So in this conversation, you've claimed the white space, I've claimed the black space, um, and we're more complicated than that, I think. 
Yeah. 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 Um, we talked a little bit about the hunting, um, how hunting makes, uh, makes it all a little weird, I guess. Um, and I didn't see the poll results of how many people said they were hunters. I don't know if um, one of our moderators can jump in. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, wow. 58%. So I just, that means I did some good marketing before this. Oh, you also. did. I love it. Um, so I'll, here's what I'll say to the, the 50, you know, the 25 of you that said no. Um, and this is kind of just, this is how Hunt to Eat operates and um, how we come at this whole conversation is that, um, yes, I love to hunt with a gun. I love to hunt with a bow and arrow. And yet your decisions every day and the food that you eat, um, it kills things. And you do so by using your dollars. So in fact, you are all hunters and you participate in a food system with your money. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a good place to start um, to understand that. And I think that's a good place to start a conversation um, of what are your choices doing to food systems? What do they do? How do those food systems impact, um, you know, the workers who are, picking those beets, killing those beets. I'm gonna say that very specifically, killing. Um, we kill both plants and animals in order to sustain ourselves. Um, it is not a harvest, it is a kill. Think something, you know, if you pull it out of the ground, if it's a carrot, it dies. Um, and that's just a, uh, I think that's also, a, I do that specifically because having a re relationship with death in, in particularly in America is something we have put in a closet, put away, um, whether it's our old folks, um, well, no, specifically, it, it is our old folks. That's probably the number one place where we have yeah. taken death and said, nope, I don't want to see it. Um, we're going to have them die in a hospital when we're not there, whatever it might be. Um, but we don't have a relationship with death, and that's, that's not a good thing for all of us. Um, it makes it um, more tenable that, pe that a police officer would kill somebody, and that's not okay. Um, and so that's why I think it's why this relates, right, is that if you can have a relationship with your food, if you can understand the death and dying of things for your consumption, um, I think you will have a bigger heart when it comes to um, how people are treated in this world. Um, so, you know, the next time you go to the store, just consider how you spend your dollars and what food system you're supporting um, and just keep that dialogue going, right? That's um, that's all I can ask of, of everyone here. Um, so let me throw in another, like, uh, so I was thinking about that. I was like, I wrote it down. We are all hunters, man. And, and I absolutely agree about the, 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 we put death in a closet. It's not something that, that many of us are comfortable with, myself included. Um, um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. I had it right there where I wanted to go. And I'm thinking about death messes me up. I wanted to, so yes, yeah, so that element of hunting in terms of death and killing things and that we're always doing that, I, for me, that's one angle. But the other angle for me, and this is when you and I were talking offline, and I said the part where I was uncomfortable was with that, is that guns are also linked to violence, for, in my mind. You know, that's what not, I know that's not all that they are. And I understand the gun in and of itself, you know, um, Oh, I'm not going to say that line because I, I have a guns don't kill people do, but there's that, you know, I, I understand that. And so, and that's the part that makes me really nervous. I know that there's a, um, you can come to understand a gun and respect it and like any piece of machinery or, you know, anything that you're using. Um, but they make me really nervous. Yeah. If I, it's not that I don't trust myself. It makes me really nervous too. Right. It means Maybe I have to trust other hurt. people with the gun. That's yeah. what it means. And that, <laughs> you know, without any relationship embedded in there, you know. Um, yeah. Well, and it's a, it's a conversation that we are going to, uh, particularly in the environmentalist conservationist movement, um, we are going to have to deal with it because um, for those folks who don't know, um, you know, 
there's, there's a thing called the Pittman Robertson Act. And essentially, anytime you buy a gun or buy ammo, and that's a big part, um, 10% of that purchase is taxed. Um, and that money goes to conservation. That is what fund, it is a very, very large part of what funds conservation in America. Protecting wild spaces, and wild animals happens because people buy guns and ammo. And let me tell you, wow. as a hunter, I'll buy two boxes of ammo this year, maybe three. Maybe if I'm waterfowl hunting, I'll buy some shotgun shells, I'll buy a little bit more. That's like the tax money off that is very, very little. But you know who buys a ton of ammo and shoots it every weekend? The black gun. The AR. The what? The AR. They are the AR-15. The oh, gun. Yeah. The gun that we want to yeah. take from from every you know from every American's hands because it's this agent of death in right. our country, right? Right. The folks shooting those guns are the people putting money into the system that protects our environment. Right. <laughs> if your head isn't spinning right now because you think we're going to solve the financial issues right. of conservation in America without dealing with that conversation, right. you are, yeah. you're, you're not in this world if you're not thinking about that relationship. Right. Um, and, and those folks to some degree, they're going to have a seat at the table right now where they don't necessarily, they're, they're, they're not, they're not coming to the table because they don't necessarily think they might need to or whatever, but it, that's going to be a conversation we're going to have to have is how are we going to fund all this stuff? Um, if we decide that, you know, you shouldn't be able to shoot that gun anymore. Um, and you shouldn't be able to shoot hundreds of rounds of ammo every weekend to practice, you know, shooting that gun. Okay, cool. Who else is going to pay for it? You buy that backpack, right? We want to talk about a backpack tax, um, you know, and the, that whole conversation. But the idea there being that you buy a mountain bike, are you paying 10% tax to go down that trail? That is a good, I actually think that's, I probably shouldn't say it, but, you know, it's outdoor recreation, as I understand it, is an $887 billion industry. So it's bigger than oil and gas. But here's the thing. It is when they talk about that number, let's be really honest. Yeah, yeah. tell me. RVing, tennis, and golf are all inside of that number. Okay. So uh, let me tell you that that number, yeah. by, by in the context of that you know, conversation, is huge. Um, so, again, we like to tout these giant numbers. Oh, we're bigger than oil and gas. We have all this power. We should have all this power. But unless we're coming with, a, with one voice on this topic, we're never going to, you know, like, the amount of dollars that REI spends on lobbyists in, in Washington is a teardrop compared to the oil and gas industry's money, you know, there. So until that $880 you know, million, uh, you know, entity really goes full force as a, as a, as a one force, we're not, we're not going to make it there, um, there, but um, yeah, before you go taking away and, that, and listen, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that everyone should willy nilly have an AR-15 and be able to shoot it, but when you're gonna start talking about taking it away from folks, let's start talking about how we, where the money comes from. Right, so, that for me, that actually yeah. makes total sense. I didn't know that, so yeah. I'm not yeah. surprised, but I didn't know it. Um, uh, I, it's a very interesting uh, <laughs> kink, kink in the conversation, I think that, uh, you know, you can't deal with uh, with all of it without dealing with that. So yeah, it reminds me of the the documentary that came out. I, I don't know if it was last year or two called Trophy, and it was on understanding how um, this is sport hunting going to Africa. Sport hunting pays for conservation. They're in bed with conservation. I mean, they have to because it's complicated, just like what you described. They that money is used for a lot of things that do protect those wild places. And supposedly, yeah. Yeah, but they have to allow those hunters to come over and spend the big bucks so they can get that money in order to do it. So it's this very, it's messy. There's a lot I, of nuance in it. Yeah, I know that Charlie and uh, Mary Scott should be coming back on. They maybe, I want to open it up so they can, we can again, bring the audience. Time. Just like you said, that hour is going to just go by like that. I told you. <laughs> My video isn't working, but okay. um, I'll maybe be up soon.
Okay. It's working. Mary Scott, your video is working. Yeah, mine, mine is mine is working. <laughs> so uh, maybe I, I'll ask the questions for now. Um, I do have a couple of questions in chat. Um, one from David Brownstein, he asks, to really build a community, the spaces and places have to actually feel safe and welcome. Can you distinguish between places and spaces where all people are supposedly welcome as distinguished from places and spaces that are indeed intended for people who have felt left out or in some way excluded from those places? Ooh, well, um... Can I distinguish? Well, sometimes I'm just going to answer this first. And Martin, if that's okay, I would say yeah. that it depends. It really depends on where the place is. I think of things like geographically where it is, and what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. If you invite me to somewhere, you know, oh God, I'm gonna whatever I say now, I'm gonna step in it. But uh, you know, what part of the country? what part of the city, rural area, sub suburbs it is, what I already know about it, what's the word on the street about that place, how, what stories do, do I know about that, have I had any experience with it, who is in the community. And so I want to know also who it is. So who runs that space? Who's the organization? What do they look like? Like what's been their record? I mean, this is the stuff that I think about. So the, a safe space you know, for me means, you know, uh, there's a level of understanding, there's a diversity of perspective and, and people, there's a, there's a way within which that space is um, organized and, and open. Uh, the space in and of itself doesn't do anything. I mean, you know, that's not true. I mean, you can have spaces that seem dangerous just because by the, the nature of their, the way they are as a space. I mean, I know that can happen. You know, I'm not going to jump in a dark river at night that I've never been in before kind of thing. But there's, it's usually for me, the people. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can only, like, I'm thinking about our hunt camps that we offer, right? Because that's, we're doing it specifically to build community, build a certain type of community. Um, and so, and what, so what does that look like? And it's, it is, it's, I have to be in relationship with people first. Yeah. Um, and so when we are bringing in mentees and mentors into our hunt camps, um, you know, they're, I'm, I'm building very specific relationships with very specific people. Um whether they're or the heads of organizations or whether they're the mentors, um, because I know they're going to bring a certain conversation to the table. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the organizations, they know that you can look at Hunt to Eat's Instagram and see black people in our Instagram feed, right? Where there's like major hunting brands still, where you literally can scroll Instagram for ages and there are no black people in there in that space and it's like well then wh why would you think that i'm welcome there so yeah like representation matters um so look at our history see who it is you know see what we've done um see who we're bringing to the table and then if you're a mentee hopefully you see that all of that and go cool this is this is something i'm willing to trust and step into um i don't know also, yeah sorry. differentiating differentiating between the two is I don't know. I, that's um, people. People can talk a lot, right? Until you see something you you don't maybe necessarily know. I don't know. That's a that's a tough question. Yeah. Well, also spaces and places and the people in them, how transparent they are about who they are and where they are in their own process and the growth yeah. and the and the change. There's something about transparency along with representation that I think is really powerful, and yep. sort of look for that. You know, there's a sense you can get. You know, and I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's much more fluid, you know. Oh, yeah, um, we're, all, we're all in a, we're, we're in our own process, right? And then how we deal with all this stuff. And so there is no, there's no end game here. There's, yeah. there's just, kind of, you know, continue to learn and evolve. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's another question that's very much related um, from Colin Crook on issues of inclusivity. Um, so I, I don't want to, it's a long question, but I don't want to paraphrase. Um, so here it is. Full disclosure, I am a white male who considers myself a hunter. 
When I and many, many others think of who comes to mind when we think of who a hunter is, it's overwhelmingly another white male, likely identifying as a Republican and likely not to be, and likely as not perceived as racist. BIPOC individuals, Native Americans, LGBTQ individuals, even socialist Democrats, of which I consider myself one, is not what comes to mind. But this is as far from the historical truth as can be. Indigenous populations are the original hunters. How did it get to this point where the white reinvention of hunting has become the predominant image that comes to mind? And how can we get hunting back to a more represented inclusive activity? Representation matters, right? <laughs> Like me, media matters, right? Um, it is um, Hunt to Eat is a you know started as an apparel brand, we moved into an education brand. Um, we are moving towards being a media company as well um, because the hunting industry doesn't seem to want to take it on, right? Like Hunt to Eat, my company is very very small in the grand scheme of the hunting space, right? We are we are ten employees maybe on a good day. Um, we are not big. We are not hedge fund, you know, sourced. Um, <laughs> like, we're tiny. And for whatever reason, the big guys, they don't want to take it on. Um, they, and I get it, you know, more than half of the hunting, the traditional hunting community probably is, um, maybe they're not open to this conversation. Um, but I am. And so we're going to keep pushing forward on it, even though we're tiny. Um, but so representation matters, right? Like scroll through Instagram, see other people there. Uh, we make movies, you'll see other people there. We write stories, you'll see not only the writer, but the subject is going to be somebody different than me. That's how we change it. Um, we go into relationships with other people um, that don't look like me so that it looks different, so that we build this community that, so it looks different. So it is different, right? I mean, that, that's all I can, yeah, it's, uh, and, it's, it's as simple as that. <laughs> yes. And part of the question I heard was how we got here it, in part was, I mean, the construction of, I mean, this sounds so fancy, but like we created this American identity, very male in the most traditional sense, identity of what it means to be a man, ideas of courage, of, of the gender, the traditional gender relations, like who's gonna go out and bring home the, you know, bring home the bacon. And, and in the old days, it was like, you're gonna go out and hunt, but uh, look at all your old movies. Who was hunting in those movies? They were, they looked like John Wayne. And yeah. they rarely, there was rarely a story told um, that it was somebody who was an, a non-white man in that position of power because guns also can represent a, a kind of power, you know, I mean, you know, just in the most general sense, you're certainly not going to tell a story about a black man or an Asian man or a man of a, a Latinx man with a gun or, or if you do, they're usually the bad guys, <laughs> right? And forget seeing a woman with a gun. Because that really changes it. So I think part of it is it ties into this mythical American identity and sense of ourselves, which doesn't mean that an aspect of it isn't true, but it became the thing, the truth, you know, this is the way it is. This is what we should aspire to. This is what a hero looks like with his gun that can go home and bring home the bacon and, you know, do everything else with it. Um, and only he knows how to do that. Only he knows how to do that. And that he looks a very particular way. And, it, and, and I'm telling it in the most simplified fashion. But for me, that's part of the way we got here. That's yeah. part of how we got here. History is written by him. <laughs> history is written by him who writes the history books, right? Um, and, and as my uh, dear friend, Nicole Qualtieri, wrote today on a Gear Junkie article, um, you know, now that they've gone and sexed all of the uh, the very old uh, uh, diggings of uh, of these graves that were, you know, from the like thirteen thousand years old, um, half of these graves of these hunters that they've unearthed, half of them are women. So <laughs> your whole <laughs> this whole history of you know men the provider, men the hunter, like give me a break. It's it's bull, you know it's baloney. It's not that's not the truth um so let's you know let's start rewriting the history books 
Um, Which in part is rewriting how we see each other. Because it means, again, if we're reflections of each other, I mean, the fact of the matter is, yeah, well, it's a, it's a much longer conversation, but we could, you know, what it means for, for I mean, I, I have not much of a problem at all looking at somebody who doesn't look like me and imagining myself in their shoes. Because I lived in a world, not because I'm so great, but because I've lived in a world where if I didn't do that, then I hardly have anybody when I was growing up to look at. So, you know, I could see if it was, you know, um, so this is going to make some people laugh. <laughs> There's a lot of things wrong with what I'm about to say, but back in my backpacking days, I was, I was really a little bit obsessed with Ronald Fiennes, who used to be with the SAS in the UK. He was considered the actual real James Bond. This guy was an outdoor adventure. I just thought, oh my God, this guy, like I had a book of, besides he was incredibly handsome, he just did all this stuff. He was like exploration. And, and I know there's a lot of levels. I was, it was in the nineties. Okay. So I, I understand there are a lot of levels were wrong. The point that I want to make is that I actually I, I felt like I could relate. I found a way that I could relate. In part, if I was looking at those things of people going out in the world and taking risks and stretching their boundaries, I couldn't find any stories about anybody who looked like me. So I was going for whatever story it was. And actually, it, it would make it so much easier for me to sit down with someone who looked like him, even if we had a really different point of view about why we show up in these spaces and have these conversations, because it's like, oh, I've had practice for a lot of years, <laughs> kind of finding my way in there and going, oh, I can kind of relate to that. I kind of see what that is. And it hasn't always been the other way around. So suddenly you're going to put, let's just you know, put a black woman on screen with a gun who's the hero of the movie and she's using, she's hunting, she's saving the world man she's putting you know the biscuits on the table and she's bringing the gravy you know like she's doing the whole thing it would be hard i think it would be really there would be pushback on who would feel like they could relate to her as a human being as the one who has the skill the one who has the knowledge the one who is the mentor not the mentee the one who's showing up the one who is excuse the expression but badassing it across the board you know it, what it would do for us to see all kinds of different people in those roles. I mean, we can talk about the violence, nonviolence, but just leave that aside for a second, that stretching our ability to relate to and see someone, not us, who was really us at the end of yeah. the day, right? That's the thing. At the end of the day, we all bleed and we all die, right? Somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, boy, I am... Today was a not it was an emotional day on a bunch of different parts, and one of them is that we have a um, we have a film project that we're working on that is in fact a, a film project around two women um, who do what you just said, um, and I cannot wait to be able to share that with all of you. Um, the first episode's coming out here in June um, because it's so powerful to see it, um, and it changes the conversation, and uh, it lets people into. Let's people into our world a little bit, but it lets people into like these two women, these two amazing women's world. Um, but yeah, like that's what we're after. That's how we change it. That's how we shift the conversation a little bit is by doing that stuff. So it's coming. Um, Charlie, Mary Scott, you got another question for us? Yeah, all right. I'm going to try to combine two questions here because they're on the same topic. Um, so one uh, attendee asked, do you completely equate killing a plant to killing an animal? Because plants don't have a family, nor do they raise their young like many animals do. And then someone responded to that saying, he's talking about the exploitation and death involved in the food and labor system, and plants do have families, culture, and feelings. Yeah, I mean, um, listen, I, like, I don't know all the research, but like people talk about um, trees being able to talk to one another, right? Like um, I, there's, a, there's a level of, I think every, every person's gonna have to decide for themselves of like what, if they're gonna equate something that can, you know, or if they know enough about plants to say like, no, they don't have a feeling or whatnot. But uh, yes, I am equating the death of a deer to the death of a carrot because there is energy and there is a living 
literally breathing thing, taking in energy from the sun that dies when you pull it out of the ground. And then the same thing happens to that deer when it dies. So um, yes, food is food and life is life. And, you know, and don't get me wrong, I'll step, I'll smack the mosquito and kill it. And that is, that is life leaving this world. Um, and is that the same as the deer? No, obviously in my brain, I compartmentalize it and I do it differently. Um, and every person's gonna do that differently, I think. Um, but hopefully you're aware about it, right? You know, I think, just, and, and what you're also saying and what I yeah. understand too is that is it, there's an honesty, there's an awareness and there's just also an honesty you know, about where we each stand. It's not that we all have to agree that no a carrot and a deer are the same. I think that actually, for me, that would limit, that limits the conversation. It's actually, what is it asking me to consider? And, and for me, what you're asking me to consider is my own uh, choices, the way that I make them. Um, what do I contribute to when I make them the way that I make them? Um, what are the privileges that I have and the agency that I have as I make those choices? What am I contributing to, you know, when I do it? And, you know, um, somebody, I can't remember, I wish I could properly um, attribute this, talked about, you know, um, a commodity chain and the idea that if you can, when you have your plate of food in front of you, do you know where everything on that plate comes from? Now, for those of us who are fortunate enough and we're living in Vermont by farms, a lot of us actually can, you know, but you know, really everything in your glass, the clothes on your back, you know, to really have a sense of when you start to have to think beyond, you know, um, the time that you exchanged money or you exchanged something so you could get that thing. That's what you're asking me. That's how I take it as my own level really? of awareness. So therefore, I'm less quick to judge and more open to the idea, and Charlie and Mary Scott will know, I've said this too because of Kaylin Tutri's, to discern, which is really different. It's like, oh, well, they're doing that. So I'm not going to judge them for it necessarily. I'm not the judging, just, instead of like, well, let me, it's going to make me think about it. Let me just, they did that. That's interesting. Okay. So what does that mean for kind of what I'm doing? Yeah. And, and listen, this is, there, the people like to, I think in our culture, there's like the purity test as well. Yeah. And I'll be brutally honest. After my race on Saturday, I ate a Whopper Junior because it's delicious, <laughs> right? Like, no, I'm not, I'm not perfect. We right. not, you're not, none of you are perfect either. We all, we all are going to do, you know, and I grew up eating fast food, whatever, like, I'm hooked on the sugar that they put in those buns, whatever it might be. <laughs> it was delicious. So were the French fries, you know? And like, I don't know where that stuff came from. It's probably gross, but I'm cognizant of the fact that I make that choice, right? And that like, is what it is. Um, and hopefully, you know, most of the rest of the meat that I eat is also the meat I've killed. So, um, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not perfect. Yeah. Yeah, we are not perfect in this conversation. Yeah. So. Um, next, I'm going to share a comment that was put in the questions and then selfishly insert a question of my own that relates very much to the food systems conversation that's happening. Um, and we might have time for another question after that, but uh, we're planning on ending at 8.30. Okay. Um, so from Patrice Nye, this conversation is so affirming as a 40-year-old Black woman that identifies as a runner, writer, foodie, wine enthusiast, traveler, a new hunter, an aspiring sharpshooter. I lay claim to many boxes as well. We need more of these types of conversations that invite and allow people to celebrate their difference and revel in the spaces that we have common ground. I certainly hope that you both will host and participate in more of these types of dialogues going forward. Thank you so much for this. Okay. I Wait, wait, before you, Charlie, I know you, I just yeah, want yeah. to have to shout out to her because I'm like, oh, I love the everything. I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, sharpshooter. That's so awesome. Okay. I just have to say that. Yeah. Right. And, I, and, I, and I, if you're a new hunter, I hope you'll come to a hunt to eat camp um, and <laughs> participate in one form or the other because uh, it'd be awesome to chat about trail running <laughs> while we're there. Um, okay. And then uh, another question. <laughs> Um, for me is, 
uh, for Mating mostly, how does the Hunt to Eat community connect to or engage with other sustainable foods, food systems like regenerative farming or subsistence farming, um, and especially those which don't exist in, in wild spaces like hunting? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, we are slow. We're not there yet. Um, like I said, we're a really small company. Um, you know, we've been, par I've been primarily making t-shirts for the last seven years. Um, the education part, the media part is building out in the last six months. Um, so, you know, like we're going to Oklahoma next week for a camp. Um, we're still, this, this is our, will be our fourth or fifth camp. Um, we're still figuring out a lot of stuff. Um, uh, but my operations, uh, uh, person here at Hunt to Eat, Dana, fantastic. Um, you know, she's a permaculture nerd. And so while she might be doing uh, operations for us right now, my hope is that she will start the permaculture um, Hunt to Eat camps that we do in the future. Um, so, you know, that's the good thing about Hunt to Eat is that um, there's, there's community, real food, conservation, like nature, that's our, those are our three company pillars. Um, inside of that, under in the hunt eat or in the hunt context, um, we talk about gardening, we talk about permaculture, we talk about foraging, we talk about um, you know hunting big game, hunting small game, um, all, you know fishing, um, all that stuff comes into play. Um, and so, I guess as a brand, you'll you'll see us dive into a lot of those conversations um, as we build out media platforms and and movies and you know and different camps and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, we're just getting started. Yes. Yeah. All right. We also have a question from James Mills. Uh, James! James. Uh, serious question. Is the AR-15 ever used for anything other than killing people? Wow. I'm not a hunter, but I can imagine, I can't imagine, I can't imagine it being used for shooting deer. Um, yes. While I think it's sometimes silly because they're generally very heavy. Um, and I like to walk around with a lighter rifle in the woods. Um, people do hunt um, with, yeah. with with black guns, I'll say. Um, yeah, so it, it, it does happen. Um, I don't think it's very common, but it does happen. Yeah. I don't have anything to say about that. Yeah. One more? We got time for one more? Yeah, one more. Um, yeah, we do. It's 821. Let me look. Uh, so... This is another question that you've, you've touched on aspects of, um, but is very valuable, I think. From Jacob Zimmer, uh, Mating, how do you go about talking to fellow white male hunters about privilege and making hunting more inclusive? Hunting has given me the opportunity to connect with people from a lot of different backgrounds, but I've encountered a lot of people who are closed off to these conversations. Oh. Um. I, I don't know that I do a very good job of it. Um, I think that I rely on uh, sharing people's lived experience um, and having those folks trust or trusting those folks to honor other people's lived experience. Um, you know, um, while Carolyn might be the fierier one on tonight's conversation, like those who know me well know that I wear my heart on my sleeve and um, I, I don't have a lot of patience for um, not being a kind human being. Um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm like, um, there's, in, in building, well, there's, the conversation has come up recently and this will be interesting to hear Carolyn's perspective on this. Um, of so much of what we see as maybe wrong, um, whether you want to talk about police brutality or mass shootings in our country, um, it's being perpetrated by young white men. Um, and so what is what do we do as Hunt to Eat in this conversation, um, or just as a human being, to give agency to young white men to not do that? to not 
you know, like what, what do I need to do? And so, um, so we've been thinking about this because at the same time, why, why I want to create a camp where, you know, everyone's welcome. And so that like, I've got a, a you know, a black mentor for a black mentee um, so they can see themselves, you know, in, in creating that community. Um, at the same time, I want to give agency to young white men to be like, hey, you're, you know, you might be a great hunter. Um, come be in this community and like share your knowledge and feel like you're in community because um, I can tell you that these mass shooters don't feel like they're in community. That's my guess, but I'm going to I'll, I'll put a hundred bucks on it, right? Um, so how do we give those folks agency to feel like they're seen and heard in our country? Um, in a country which, which is like, it's, it's almost seems, it seems ridiculous to say that because this country is literally made for white men to succeed better than everybody else. Like if you don't get that, then I don't, it's a hard time. I, don't have, a, I have a hard time helping you out if you don't see that our country is like made for you to get past everybody else. Um, and yet at the same time, for some reason, you, you feel like you can't make it and I want to help you <laughs> you don't feel heard. Um, it's like, uh, that's really hard. Um, so I don't and, and so from Yeah. Saving, so, and I would say that, it. that, you know, I think, so in following on your, the, you know, the, the line of thought that the country is made for white men to survive, uh, to succeed everyone, you know, succeed better than everyone else. And many of them don't succeed. And I think that's part of what the issue is, you know, because yeah. what do you do when that's the case? <laughs> and then you don't succeed. And you don't succeed in large part because the system, I, I think there's just problems with the systems all in place. Not everybody makes it. And what, what does that mean anyway, you know? make it, how much money you have, how many houses you're able to buy, how many cars you're supposed to have. You know, there's a way, there, there's so many places in the journey that are problematic. If you are a young white man who grew up in a working class family, um, let's say in the rural South or Midwest, uh, where your family, your parents have always worked hard and, but you know, doing the best, man, just to make, if, if they have a small home, you know, to make the payments and don't own any land, you know, because can't afford it. And suddenly you are sort of thrust into adulthood with a certain set of expectation that this goes back to, you know, being misunderstood. I'm just going to say it, that yeah. there is a, as a young white man, not only just from other people, but also maybe even from your family and from those that you have community with, an expectation of what you are able and supposed to do. And sometimes, and this is very oversimplified, but it comes out in bullying and bad behavior and racist behavior to others not like you. Because actually you've never been taught, you know, you know how to um, first be a human being and not, you know, the only expectation I believe we all have in life is that we're all going to die. I'm sorry to be harsh that way, but these days I'm feeling like that. You know, everything else for me is what we decide to make it and the choice we make and how we show up in our lives in relationship to everybody else. And I just think there are young white men who, um, I, you know, I lived for four years in Kentucky and a lot of the students who came through, I learned a lot from, you know, people whose parents worked in coal mines. And, you know, after hearing their stories, I had a very different perspective on, you know, I, I don't, you know, I have a problem with mountaintop removal, and I do. And actually, I can't just talk about it like it's not going to affect some families <laughs> who are, who, who can't suddenly go out and just get another job, you know, because we're not going to do that anymore, right? They, you know, they paid in many, in many cases, they paid with their bodies, and their life. And, you know, so it's not that I don't, I don't, I'm not condoning violence, but what I understand, I think, as a human being is that when you, when there's an expectation that has been inferred your whole life, even if it's, if it's never been directly said, you say, it's been inferred that success, but you can't get it. And you can't get it. And who are you going to blame? <laughs> well, 
I'll tell you that the corporate man will tell you to blame the black guy. That's what I'm telling you. I, I was waiting for somebody else to say it. Right? Who are you going to blame? Are the black guy or the brown girl or the, uh, the one who looks Asian or the one who looks Middle Eastern or the one who fill in the blanks right down the line? Yeah. You know? Be because I think you've been sold the idea that you're going to be Jeff Bezos, and I'm yeah. telling you right now, you're not. So, sorry. I hope Bye. no one is. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Save us, save us from that one, because that's I was just, just saying. I, I hope no one here becomes Jeff Bezos. <laughs> nope. I don't have time for another question. <laughs> is that it? I think that might be it. It's eight twenty-nine. All right. But Ting, we have to do it again. Okay. But you, I'm, I'm telling him what to do, everybody. But I'm just suggesting. <laughs> you you need to invite me to your space. Mm. <laughs> I did. I did. You said you couldn't come. No, I. that's not what I said. No. Look at not, all the not audience not. is listening. I said, I said I have to think about how that might be. And I just, I just can't come to the next trip. Because no, no, you know, know. This is, I, my schedule is insane. But that, I just wasn't. I never. I can't. We can talk about it. Yes. Yes. No. You're. You're. We, I've got a. I've got a good spot for us to do this. So. Yeah. See. Yeah. See, uh, your your mother and father are hearing me. I said I will do it. <laughs> we go. Um, Mary Scott, Charlie, thank you for uh, being here with us tonight, and uh, and. Uh, Thank you, Middlebury College, for inviting me. And uh, yes. of course, thank you. Yes. Martin, thank you, actually, for, you know, you said yes right away for bringing some of your friends that are and people you know in the audience. I love having really diverse, different kinds of audiences. I think it's fantastic. Charlie and Mary Scott, you rock, you rock, you rock. Janet Weissman, always. I know Johnny's behind there doing the tech work. Um, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who came today with your great questions and your open minds and open hearts especially on this night. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for this conversation. Yes. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the flip side. On the flip side. <laughs>